As the calendar officially turns to August, we are in our last month with a hockey. That means it's the calm before the storm. Your Locked On Hurricanes, your daily podcast on the Carolina Hurricanes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to a Friday edition of Locked On Hurricanes, your team every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you to the everyday for making this your first listen of the day. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, talking everything about your Carolina Hurricanes. I am your host, Zach Martin. I am the Carolina Hurricanes beat writer over at the Hockey Writers, along with my Chicago Wolves column, Wolves Weekly. I am the co-host of the Search Cast, which is a weekly Carolina Hurricanes podcast, along with all of my dues here at Locked On Hurricanes. If you're on the YouTube side of things, you can see I have a special guest with me today. I'm very excited to have him on. He is the senior editor of the North State Journal, while he, where he does his Carolina Hurricanes beat. He is also the Carolina chapter head of the Professional Hockey Writers Association, and he does Carolina Hurricane stuff over at The Athletic. I am very happy to have Corey Laviolette join the podcast. Corey, how are you doing, and how's your summer been? Uh, mostly good. Besides, besides some uh, air conditioning problems in the house, it's been uh, it's been good. Oh, no. So, uh, oh, but the air, the air conditioning has not been good. So that's been a um, <laughs> catching me on a better day when it's working. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, yeah, I think when I first when we first got our house, probably end of like August of twenty two, it like the like the day after we moved in just shut off, and it's like, cool, that's a great sign. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, like I said, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I know you know. Thankfully, we're we're not into the craziness of having a Stanley Cup final game, the draft, and free agency all within a week, and we're a month away from the regular season. So we're in a kind of a nice little, like, it's not too crazy, but it's coming. We're almost there, <laughs> which is kind of wild. So I want to get your thoughts on the Carolina Hurricanes this offseason. Just before we dive into actual players and stuff like that, like what have your feelings have been just throughout this whole process of after the cup finals done and going through the draft and free agency with just as the Canes overall? I mean, I think the biggest thing is I think they made a lot of good decisions um, with the hires they had to make. Um, so uh, obviously Don Waddell leaves and that leaves a big hole. He essentially had two jobs. He was president of the team, which, yes, that's the financial aspect of the team, but it's also handling everything that goes on at PNC Arena and concerts and um, and all that stuff. And then he was the general manager also. Um, we know that their front office is collaborative, but you know, Don was the, the point man on all of that, the guy who was making the phone calls, all that. Um, but I think they made they made good hires um, to replace Don and they replaced him with three people, essentially. Um, so, you know, Eric Tolsky obviously has paid his dues with the organization. Uh, really bright, had a big voice anyway in that collaborative front office. Um, so I think he's deserving. You know, he had been interviewed a couple times, you know, Chicago, and I think he was... Mm -hmm he was pretty close in, in Pittsburgh had Kyle Dubas not shook loo uh, shaken loose from uh, Toronto. I think, you know, Eric Tulski is probably the GM in, in Pittsburgh right now instead of in Carolina. So, um, so, you know, I, he was ready to do this job. And I think uh, so far uh, he's got a little trial by fire. So uh, it's been an interesting off season. One of the tougher ones, especially for a contending team, you know, there are tough off seasons when you're bad, but when you're good and you want to stay good, those are, uh, there's a lot of eyes on you. So, uh, and then obviously bringing back Doug Wharf, who I, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Doug, um, but he started as an intern with the Hurricanes and worked there for, I think he said um, yesterday, 16 years uh, yeah. and left, went to MDO Holdings, which for those around the area, it's like O2 Fitness and Rise Donuts and um, BB's Chicken, all that stuff. Uh, and kind of spread his wings a little bit on his own. And then this opportunity shows up and he comes back and he's a guy who loves the team, knows the team, knows the fan base, uh, knows the arena, all those things. And, and then Brian Fork uh, comes from the general assembly from Senator Berger's uh, as Senator Berger's chief of staff. And he comes in a little more to oversee everything that's coming, which, um, you know, maybe we haven't talked about enough this off season, but there are big changes coming to the area, to the, the arena uh, renovations. And then, uh, all the construction that's going to happen over the next three, five, ten years um, is going to totally change what what it's like to go to a, a Hurricanes game. So 
Um, yeah, a cra- kind of a crazy off season from even when you don't even step onto the ice and think about the things that had to happen there. Um, you know, Tom Dundon had to make, make a lot of tough decisions, uh, just putting the right guys in place and we'll see if they're the right guys or not. Um, but, uh, so far so good, I would say. Yeah, no, definitely for sure. Yeah. It's like you said, it's, that's something that I don't think you're, like everyone's even thinking about. Like you said, just around the arena, new additions to like food and beverages and just sweets and all that stuff. So that's going to be very interesting to see how parking is going to be. Cause we all know tailgating is a big thing for the hurricane, especially for the fan base. So that's going to be kind of interesting to take a look at as well. And just talking about, you know, the trial by fire for Eric Tolsky, like how have you felt that he's done kind of so far with the fact that you're like, he takes over for Don Waddell at a time where you're like, okay, you know, there's a lot of UFAs coming up and then you go into your first draft and then it's your first free agency, not even that long after, like how you feel that Eric's kind of done so far in his short time as the Hurricanes GM? Well, I think he's stuck true to what the organization has been, which is, um, they're not scared to take chances, but they're not going to bet against father time most of the time. Um, so you look at guys like Brett Pesci and, uh, and Brady Shea in particular, uh, very key players who are on very reasonable deals for a long time here. Um, and they were due to get raises. It's that simple. Um, but they're both, you know, 30 or right on the precipice of 30 and, you know, giving out eight, seven, six, five year deals to those guys can, you know, when you have a guy like Brent Burns, who you see him and you see him at 36 and 37 and say, oh, he's still a good defenseman, then, you know, you don't have to worry too much about that him falling off of a cliff. Now, skills deteriorate. Sure, they always do for everyone. But you worry about especially defensemen like when you're 32, you see just so many guys where they they fall off a cliff. So that I mean, I think that was a priority for the team was staying true to that. And I think they did. Yeah, um, no. For, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So that, you know, that that's obviously, uh, you know, I think a testament to Eric is not getting caught up in that moment and trying to, um, you know, keep the team together and, and still be the same team. There was an understanding coming into this season and then uh, throughout the season and then heading into free agency that they're going to lose guys. Because that's just, you know, when you have guys on good deals, you know, <laughs> all the guys who left were on good deals. There was nobody who left who you were like, man, that was a really bad contract. And thank God it's off the books. Everybody who left was, man, that's a really value contract. And you know what that means? That means they're going to get paid more. So to me, that was the biggest thing was I, he, I don't think he, uh, I don't think things change too much as to what the, um, you know, what the focus of the team has been. And so I think he's done a good job in that. And then he went and found value. Um, they had to take a step, a step back. Obviously you, you have to, when you lose as much as they did, but um you know, still found value, value players uh, on contracts. And they've done a really good job at holding on to draft picks and accumulating draft picks. And then you just sit back and hope those guys start to hit. And that's, that's how you stay consistently good in a salary cap situation. You can't, you know, it's, it's coming for, you know, it's, it's already come for Pittsburgh. It's coming for Tampa, you know, all this stuff, you know, the salary cap comes for everyone. If you're going to spend, 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 and the hurricanes are trying to avoid that. Yeah. Hey, good thing we're not Toronto Maple Leafs. We got like what 40 million plus into four guys. So at least we're not in that kind of cap situation. But like, yeah, you agree. and and we've all heard from Don Waddell over the last few years. There's no knee jerk reactions from the hurricanes. They're not gonna go and be like, okay, we need to go spend like nine, ten million dollars on this guy and this guy and this guy and stuff like that. That's where you kind of see the where these they're gonna find the value in the deals where they can guys at certain ages. And you talk about how Brace and you know Brett Pesci one of those raises and you kind of like where their age is at you're like you, you kind of do or you do not want to give that contract to them but you look at jacob slavin right around that same age group as those guys but he gets a really great deal under six and a half for eight years and it goes to the shows of how jacob slavin is compared to you know all other defensive defensemen in the league like what does it speak to just the fact that where he's at at his age that he got that type of contract for that long and such a great value too, all things considered. Yeah. I mean, I think Jacob's a unique situation because he's a guy and I'm, I'm not suggesting that Brady Shea and Brett Pesci are after the money, but we all know what Jake, we all know, we all know what Jacob's about. Um, he's a family guy. He's, you know, set down roots here um, with his family, with a church, all of those things. So, you know, he's made Raleigh his home. So when you have that situation, 
you're in a pretty good situation negotiating <laughs> angle, right? Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, guys like Pesci and Shea, um, you know, don't have, have full families yet, you know, and, you know, there's a chance to make money and Jacob Slavin's still going to make money. <laughs> you know, he's, oh, yeah. he's going to be okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, be all right. yeah. <laughs> so it's a, uh, you know, he's a unique situation, but I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, what they want to preach is, you know, Hey, if we can, you know, and I, I think they've been willing to go longer. They were willing to go longer term with Vincent Trocek just at a lower number. Um, right. So, you know, that's the, you know, the decisions players have to make is, you know, do I want to be a, you know, big money player in a, in a market, you know, and obviously New York is a great place for Trocek to land and he's been on a contender and that's worked out fine for him. Uh, the question is, is that deal going to work out fine in two years or in three years? Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, when you still have a lot of time left on that contract. So that's the things they try to avoid. And by a guy like Jacob Slavin, I think he's going to age well because he plays the game so smart. Mm -hmm. Um, and he doesn't get beat up out there. You know, he's not a player who takes a lot of punishment. Um, you know, I Brett Pesci has been a warrior for this team, but he pretty beat up over the course of his career with shoulder injuries. Um, a, a couple little things this year that were freak things, but um, yeah. you know, uh, but at, at this, you know, you wonder is he going to lose a step? Is is Father Time going to catch up to to Brett Pesci? Is it going to catch up to Brady Shea? Yeah. Um, you know, I think Jacob Slavin has a chance to age better than those two. And like I said, the, you know, and like you said, the, the value on that contract is insane. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it goes to show just like how, how elite he is. But for the fact that you got him in such a steal is you'll take that any day of the week. And like you said too, with the fact that you look at the circumstances of how Jacob Slavin plays, it's, not everyone could be a you know two time league being winner as a defenseman should have been three in a row, but you know, and we're not even going to get into the Norris conversations because that's a whole different thing by itself. But yeah, it's it's definitely a unique situation for the Hurricanes, especially with how all those contracts and stuff worked out. So I know we kind of touched on Shane Pesci. So there's we're going to talk about kind of like the subtractions from the team before we go into the additions. So we'll get to that here in a second on a Friday edition of Locked On Hurricanes. Passion, drive, and patience. The former for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Rather than to speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time, or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring them huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Welcome back to segment two of Locked on Hurricanes, your team every day. So at the end of segment one, we are kind of discussing a little bit of, you know, guys who did leave the Hurricanes. Now we're getting into the, I would say, probably what could be the biggest attractions from the team. Corey, who would you say would probably be the kind of like the biggest attraction from the Hurricanes of the guys who did essentially leave in free agency or with Jay Gensel, a trade to Tampa Bay? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think your biggest loss is is Pesci and Shea, for sure. Um, the Jake Gensel thing to me is really interesting because I think in, in most situations, people would look at that and say, okay, deadline deadline rental, we know what we're getting. We're going to get a guy. He's going to leave. That's what's going to happen. And then there was hope, right? So yeah. people's uh, <laughs> expectations change. Um, and, you know, it becomes different. If Jake Gensel had agreed to an extension with the Hurricanes the day of the trade, payment to uh to the penguins would have been more um that's just how these things work so yeah. you know i losing jake gensel is a big loss until you mm -hmm. kind of pull back and think well who you know what deadline rentals usually resign there's not a ton you know i mean we saw yeah. the Vegas after they won the cup you know resigned you know some guys and things like that mm -hmm. but um so to me that's a big loss, but it's kind of a big loss in a different way in the sense that you've, you know, essentially he was a rental and yeah. you go into it expecting you're going to lose him. So to me, it's, it's, uh, it's Shea and Pesci for sure. But, 
you know, you're, you're going to miss Stefan Mason. I mean, there's a good gritty veteran guy. Um, but you know, you've got young guys coming, you've got bottom six guys, you have people who can do the things he does hopefully. And I, you know, time moves on, I think is the big thing you have to take from this. Everybody wants everyone to be resigned most of the time because they yeah. get a, you know, they get an attachment to these players, you know, Tabo Terabine and certainly, you know, you, you get an attachment to a guy who's been here as long as he's been, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as Ben Sebastian Ajo's running mate, all of those things. Um, you, you're, you'll miss that, but at the same time, you have to realize, well, you know, time comes for everyone. So it, it's been a, you know, a good run for him here, but it, you know, he goes to Chicago now we'll see how he does there. You know, he's probably going to play a lot of minutes. He's probably going to lose a lot of games. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And what's the old adage of like, it's you do the same thing over and over again. It's kind of the definition of insanity. And we saw that. It, yeah, the Hurricanes have made the playoffs six years in a row, you know, haven't gone one around every year, two Eastern Conference final appearances. But at the same time, like you said, time comes for everyone. Sometimes you do need a shakeup. And that's just kind of how the way it goes. It's not like, you know, pre lockout of 04 05, where it's like, all right, Detroit Red Wings, go and just go and get every. Hall of Famer that you can get because there is a salary cap. Now it's like, all right, now we're going to make it fair. And that's just kind of where we're at right now. So, and like, and that's, I think that's the underlying effect of like, yeah, you lose Steph Nason where you're looking at it. Like, yeah, he was a bottom six guy, but he played a lot of power play minutes. He was the net front presence guy that I think, and I don't know how you feel about this, but it's like, I feel like the Hurricanes still kind of don't have that guy, you know, before Steph Nason that was like, here's your, net front to screen the goalie and stuff like that. Like, do you think that could still be something the Hurricanes could possibly work on? Or do you think we probably have someone who could be that net front presence guy, like what a Stefan Nason was for the last few yeah, years? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we saw it a bit this season, which was Seth Jarvis did that on the first unit. You know, Nason was usually on the second. And I think Seth mm -hmm. Jarvis is going to be the guy that is going to be, you know, in there cleaning things up a lot. He does a really good job with it. He's good behind the net. I think he's a superstar in the making, you know, I, I don't think there's any 100%. doubt that, he, that he's, you know, just ultra talented and driven and all the things you want and, and then committed, you know, to playing every situation, playing defense, all those things. I mean, um, obviously there's a contract that still needs to get done there. Um, but I, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, he wants yeah. to be here. The Hurricanes want him here. It's just a matter of the, the shape this contract takes, whether he wants to bet on himself or not. But to right. me, he's that he's that guy, I think, that, um, you know, will be – and he's not the biggest, you know, not the biggest guy, not the, you know, snarliest guy in the world, but right. uh, he's, but he's good. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, just no big deal. Come off a career year and, like, everything leads the team in power play goals and – leads the team in playoff goals as well. So, yeah, I think I think we're pretty good with Seth Jarvis for sure. So we talked about the biggest subtractions. What do you think would be the biggest additions to the Carolina Hurricanes this free agency period? You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, I'll be curious to see um, how Walker does on defense. I think there's going to be a transition period. I think your biggest addition might be the fact that you lose Pesci and Shea and now all of a sudden, Dmitry Orlov is going to be in a top four role. And I think anybody who watched every game last year or most of the games last year saw what Dmitry Orlov could do as he got comfortable in this system, right. you know, was just became the player that, you know, I think everybody knew he was uh, in Washington and then briefly in, in Boston, too. Uh, and now he's going to get a bigger role. And I mean, I think, you know, that's that's a big that's a that's a big deal because I. I, I would guess he wasn't thrilled last year to be on the third pair to play, you know, not really play a lot of special teams. Um, and now I think that opportunity is going to present him, present itself. You know, I think he's probably going to be more consistently on the penalty kill. I think he might get a chance on the power play. We'll see how, how all that shakes out with, uh, with the new guys there. But um, I, to me, that's the big, I think that's the biggest thing. I know it's not an addition, but I think right. getting a chance to see Dmitry Orloff play a bigger role um, and, you know, more opportunities for him to be physical on defense, which is something the Hurricanes have lacked. Mm -hmm. um, but he's, God, he's like a fire hydrant out there. I mean, he is a yeah. he is a thick, thick man, and I, I would not want him running into me. And he was, he's not scared to do it either. You see him step up and, uh, 
yeah, he got called for a couple penalties in the playoffs where in, in the in late in the season where I was just like, what what is going on? Just because this guy's yeah. a a tree trunk doesn't mean it's a penalty. <laughs> right, exactly. That's like looking at Svechikov and be like, okay, what did he do exactly? Like, I know some of the penalties were like, come on, what are you doing? But there's also ones where it's just where 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 was this penalty from? So yeah, I totally get yeah and. And I think it's pretty interesting when we talk about Orlov because he because you know kind of struggled to start the season, trying to figure out who his partner was, and him and Jalen Shaffield played really really well together for pretty much what would you say consider like sixty five percent of the season. So I'm curious too if they move just move Jalen up with them just that way they can kind of stay together. Or I've seen Orlov Walker in certain places as well. But I want to get your opinion on Shane Gossespierre and him coming back for a second run. And thankfully this is not a a rental like we saw two seasons ago. Now it's all right, three years and a really good deal. Like, what do you what do you feel about uh, Ghost coming back for another run? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the benefit of getting him is he's a guy who's not going to come in here and be on the ground floor trying to learn how this team plays. Now there's going to be an adjustment after playing a you know after playing only you know 25 games with a you know with the Hurricanes and then going mm-hmm. to Detroit and playing there. But at the same time, you know, it's not like he's going to have to reinvent the wheel and learn, you know, how this team plays. So um, there's that, you know, not the greatest defensive player in the world, but, you know, neither was Tony D'Angelo a few years ago. And we saw what, you know, what kind of season he could have. And even Tony D'Angelo in the playoffs, to be honest with you, I thought was, was really good. Like uh, did not, did not expect it after him having a, you know, mostly a season of watching in the press box. Um, Yeah. So I, I mean, I think, you know, there's the, the team as a whole is so good defensively that hopefully that, you know, that helps clean up any mistakes Gostas Bear must, might make. And, and you mentioned, you know, Sean, you know, is Sean Walker going to play with Orloff? How is that going to work? Are they going to keep Chat, Chatfield and Orloff together? Well, Chatfield and Gostas Bear played together um, quite a bit when Gostas Bear was here. So you also have that combination mm-hmm. of, uh, and obviously I think Jalen Chatfield has, you know, blossomed uh, since that time and really become a confident player and and somebody they can count on. And obviously they thought that with his new deal, but um, yeah, there's, it's going to be, to me, that's one of the more intriguing things about camp is how do the D pairs shake out? I think we know who the six guys will be, you know, as long as there's no injury, I think Scott Morrow is best suited spending, you know, playing top line minutes in the AHL for, yeah. for a season. Um, I think that's the best thing that can happen to him. And, and, you know, maybe even dominating down there, we'll see how he transitions, but um, yeah. So uh, to me, that's one of the more interesting things. Obviously there's some things up front that are going to be fun to watch too, but uh, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what Rod Brindamore does and what Tim Gleason does and how they um, pair the defense up. Cause they're, you know, Rod Brindamore and Gleason aren't infallible. You know, we saw last year, they wanted to put Chatfield and, and D'Angelo together and D'Angelo and Orloff together. And, you know, none of that really ever worked, you know, yeah. Tony had a tough time and Orloff was having a tough time and, you know, they, they figured it out, but it took, it took a while, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that yeah. a lot of that contributed to the goalie situation too, you know, like, you know, the goalie struggling. So um, yeah. that to me, that's one of the more interesting things to watch because they're going to have to get everybody up to speed, get everyone comfortable with each other. Uh, and it's so important in the system that everybody's on the same page. So um, to me, that's the, you know, yeah, we can talk about this. Bradley Nadeau make the team out of camp. Like that's exciting. Former first round pick, you know, right. could he be in yeah. the top six, you know, and that's exciting. But as far as to the success of the team, I think the biggest thing is going to be how things shake out on, on the, on that bottom, uh, bottom four defenseman. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And that's what the Hurricanes have mainly been known for is their defense and just the structure. Because I mean, you know, you're always a you know a top five team for a reason in terms of defense. And you look at the penalty kills, always top one essentially. Yeah. So it's it's gonna definitely be interesting to watch too. And I wouldn't be surprised if they throw Ty Smith in as the seventh defenseman, like you said, and you just give Scott Morrow time in the AHL. Because I mean, why not? He's young. Just give him a full year pro. He just – it's it just makes sense. So I could see Ty Smith kind of being like your seventh D-man at this point. I'm a closet Ty Smith fan, so just so everyone's aware ahead of time. Um, I'm not always right on these things, but I've always liked his game. I always thought he was fun to watch, obviously. Uh, I remember talking to Chico Resch um, in the last season that Ty Smith played in New Jersey when he was really struggling, and he kind of felt like the league had figured the kid out, and that was what the problem was. Um 
but then he goes to Pittsburgh and it's just not a great fit for him. And, um, you know, he gets beat out by Joseph on defense and ends up, you know, spending the year in the AHL and things like that. I think this could be a good opportunity for him. Uh, And he's a guy that can play on the power play and stuff and produce points. And uh, I, I'm, he's a, he's a dark horse guy to watch, especially if if an injury happens or if they need him uh, Mm -hmm. in the season on a call up or something, he's a guy for me um, to keep an eye on. Cause I think if he can get comfortable and the one benefit the hurricanes have going on this year that they didn't last year is, you're going to have an AHL coach who's playing the same way yeah. that, that, uh, you know, the hurricanes are playing. So it's not going to be as much of a, you know, Hey, here you go. You're playing this way, but sorry, you've been playing for random AHL team that plays different ways. And, um, so, uh, I don't think that's going to benefit a lot. And I, I, I actually really like Ty Smith. I'm not saying the kid's a top four defenseman or anything, but I thought that was a pretty savvy get, um, you know, in, in a situation where you're not really, you know, he's he's not the marquee guy in the deal by any means. Right. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, it's just, it's a nice little extra bonus for the fact you bring him back. Why not? You have all those other guys and you also bring in Riley Stillman, who son of Stanley Cup champion, Corey Stillman, another guy you could possibly look at too. NHL experience, done a lot of NHL experience with the Rochester Americans. So like you said, it's nice to have an AHL team where it's like, okay, we can develop our guys how we want them to, and we don't have to worry about Ryan Suzuki getting no minutes in Springfield, and he's just kind of wasting the season away somewhere else. It's yeah, it's the nice. big one was was Ponomarev. I mean, they that's why they pulled Ponomarev <laughs> out yeah. of Tucson was that he wasn't playing, and they were just like, how is this guy who just played on a Calder Cup team not getting don't ice time? Me. <laughs> um, and I get you want to develop your guys, but man, if you're going to take this kid on, use him. Um, right, so exactly. Obviously, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we're bringing we're bringing him back to Chicago. We we kind of need something here, but uh, that's yeah, just, yeah. oh my goodness. So we did the biggest subtractions, biggest additions. Now we get to talk about kind of the saga that was surrounding a certain player from the Czech Republic or Czechia or however you want to pronounce it, and. Kind of mentioned it earlier, talking about one Seth Jarvis and what his contract could possibly look like. We'll get to that here in a second on a Friday edition of Locked on Hurricanes. All right, guys, we got to talk about FanDuel. I know just like you, I love sports, and we love them so much we never want them to stop. Especially for us hockey nerds who just want hockey all the time, but unfortunately we just can't get that. But we do have MLB and NASCAR and everything else that's going on too, and the Olympics and golf. So there's still at least something going on for us. But the fact is the sports aren't sporting who want them to, but the good thing with FanDuel is they can let you, me and whoever keep the sports going however we want. All we got to do is open up the app and bet anytime we're in the mood. And this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head on over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Welcome back to a segment three of Locked on Hurricanes, your team every day. So at the end of segment two, we were kind of talking about just everything that's going on with the additions and subtractions. And we finally get to talk about the saga that was of one Martin Nietzsche. And Corey, I don't know about you, but I am kind of glad that this whole Will he, won't he, is officially done. Like, what are your thoughts on just that? Before we even get to the contract, just that whole saga of Martin Nietzsche's as a whole. Yeah, you know, it all starts with Martin's dad, you know, making some comments in the Czech press and uh, Don Waddell Waddell kind of firing back jokingly and then packing his bags and leaving (laughs) and leaving town, (laughs) leaving that mess. Yeah, like like, like the next Monday you're like, um... Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then trying to trade for him. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole thing was uh, was a little bizarre. Uh, there was definitely a lot of smoke around him, you know, at the draft. His name was up a lot. Um, some of the stuff that you've heard out there, I don't think is totally true. Um, I think, you know, I, I know the Columbus thing was uh, legitimate. A couple of the other rumors that I've seen put out there by some people, um, not so sure those are correct. Um so, you know, you've heard probably a couple other teams mentioned that Natchez had turned down deals or the Hurricanes turned down deals. I'm not really sure that's true. Um, and those things yeah. happen when you're 
trying to get information out there. But um, so, you know, I think Columbus was the one that could have happened on. And, um, you know, that kind of fell apart in, you know, it, it's a two way street on deals like that because Columbus isn't going to trade for Natchez uh, for two years, they, they want a, a long-term commitment. So they yeah. would need to get him signed to a long-term deal. Um, and if that gets hung up, then the whole deal falls apart. So I, I feel like that's probably what, what went down there. Um, and then, you know, you go from there and, you know, Natchez's bargaining power pretty much goes away, right? He, you know, there's yeah. nobody who's going to give an offer sheet, uh, that can really do anything that makes sense. You know, the way offer sheets work is the Coke and Yemi deal. You know, you give somebody way more than they're worth. Um, and make that work out. So, um, you know, then you get to a point where you just have to come to an agreement. And I think the two year deal gives both sides what they want. Now the hurricanes get a player who does not have to think about his contract, um, for this whole upcoming season. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we've seen, and you know, uh, whether that's the reason or not, the last two times that Marty was up for a contract extension, his season kind of unraveled a little bit. Um, last year wasn't a bad year, uh, but it certainly wasn't up to the level of the year before. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I think the Hurricanes can hope like, hey, maybe this gets figured out and he has a good season. And to be honest, if he has a great season and he's feeling great about his role and he's feeling great, the Hurricanes and Natchez can then go and be like, all right, let's let's do an extension. You know, they can do it a year early and lock him up if they feel like that's what locked on him up. Sorry, I'm trying to help <laughs> <you> out. <laughs> I see what you did there. And that was, that was um, yeah. yeah, I was gonna I was gonna make an eBay motors joke earlier too, because I heard you mention the the headlights, and my son actually bought headlights. I should have got a coupon code from you or something. Um oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you told me sooner, I would have helped you out there, but I know, but uh <laughs> yeah, so um you know, I think both sides are happy. Like I said, I think the Hurricanes get Natchez on a reasonable deal, you know, six and a half million. They don't have to worry about if Natchez has a big year this year, what it looks like after that. You know, we saw what Matthew Kachuk did having one year left, you know, and what he was able to do and force his way out. Um, this takes it to a different level. And then the Natchez side of things, Natchez and his agent get the certainty that no matter what happens within two years, he can go where he wants to go if he doesn't want to stay. Um, so, you know, ideal, maybe not for either side, you know, Martin Natchez was in a, a bad situation of a player who played essentially four years on his three year ELC, you know, he, he gets the, the slide that first year, uh, yeah. and wins a Calder cup and, um, it doesn't count as one of his ELC years. Cause it's a contract slide and that's yeah. tough to play. You know, you're, you know, a guy who's played your whole life and it's not just about the money but at the same time if somebody told you you know hey we're gonna give you fifty thousand dollars a year for three years uh and then we're gonna pay you you know uh five times that in the fourth year and then they go oh by the way that fourth year you're still uh you're still gonna make fifty thousand dollars you'll be like yeah. what just happened here yeah um, right so uh yeah so i i mean the good news, and I've, I've said this in a couple different places, and I probably have said it in print too, or in digital print, is there's there's not bad feelings here. This isn't a situation where, you know, Rod Brendamore and Martin Natchez don't get along, that they don't like each other, that, you know, maybe there's a difference of opinion on, you know, what would make Martin Natchez the best player. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, Rod Brendamore is not out to hold anybody back. You know, he wants whatever's best for the team. And, you know, yes, maybe Martin Natchez scores more points in a wide open style. Um, but, you know, so does Jeff Skinner. And we've seen where that's taken Jeff Skinner in his career. Um, and, that, you know, that's the reason that Jeff Skinner was gone. The second Rod Brindamore walked through the door was, you know, if you have a guy who's not willing to, you know, commit to playing 200 feet. And I'm not, I'm not accusing Martin Natchez of that. I think there are some glimmers of good defensive play there. I think there just needs to be more. Um, right. And maybe that, maybe that opportunity presents itself this year. You know, he killed penalties two years ago and was actually pretty good at it. Uh, and with Tavo Teravine and leaving, maybe that's an opportunity for him to do that again and maybe even create some offense off of it. Um, and we know what Sebastian Ajo and Natchez can do uh, in open ice situations, the way they play together at three on three. So um, yeah, the whole thing was a little wild. Um, 
you know, uh, it kind of overlapped with the Jake Gensel stuff, which was a little weird. Um, yeah. because, because Gensel, you know, kind of walked to the hurricanes till, till late in the first round before he, um, you know, finally told them, no, you know, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not going to be resigning. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden everything's, everything's different. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was a, you know, kind of a weird uh, situation there where you could have been keeping Gensel losing Natchez and then instead you end up the other way. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, like I said, I don't think there's a, you know, yeah, I think Martin Natchez wanted a fresh start somewhere, but I don't, you know, everything I know about the situation was it, it wasn't like he wanted a fresh start and, and kind of an, I got to get the hell out of here kind of way. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Hey, maybe I, you know, maybe I can do more somewhere else. And from what I understand, he had a chance to do that and maybe didn't want to um, based on the deals that were out there. And because of that, you end up with, you know, he, he's making a choice, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think he can be mad that there weren't more teams meeting the hurricanes asking price, you know, and the hurricanes are right to say, this kid could be a star player. We're not going to give him up for pennies on the dollar. We're more than happy to bring him back and let him be a big part of what we do. And with table Terra vine and gone with Jake Gensel gone, there's an opportunity for him to do that. And, um, playing center. I don't know so much because I don't think Rod Brindamore really um, thinks that, you know, he took a lot of convincing on Sebastian Ajo, if everyone remembers that. And Sebastian oh, Ajo proved him wrong. Um, but I remember Rod telling me how, you know, he's like, well, how big are centers usually? You know, he's only six feet. And I kind of looked at Rod and I was like, you're only six feet, but <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that. that like, I'm not saying that to Rod Brennamore, but <laughs> Rod's uh, obviously in a different weight class than Sebastian. Um, uh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't, maybe they'll take a swing at that again. I, I don't think they will. I think they like what he does on the wing and I think they still believe yes. Barry Kokanyemi can, can fill a, a role in the top six in the middle We'll see if that happens. I mean, he's got to prove it. You know, there's a lot of guys who have a lot of things to prove this year. You know, Martin Natchez has a lot to prove. He's got to prove that he can be the guy he was two years ago and not the guy he was last year. But not that he was bad, but he was not a star player last year. And he has the opportunity to be a star player if he plays consistently like he did two years ago. Andrei Svechnikov has a lot to prove. You know, we can say, all right, you had the excuse last year. You're coming off a knee injury. Everybody says, you know, the second year after the knee injury is when you start to feel better again. Okay, kid, you, there's no excuses. Go out there now and become a 30 goal and a, you know, 90 point player. Let's see it. Um, and certainly, yes, Perry Kokaniemi has a lot to prove. Um, he doesn't have to be a 60 point guy, but if he can be a 45 point guy that, you know, he doesn't have to play on the power play. You know, you just need somebody who's going to be able to hold things down in the middle on a second line. And, um, obviously they didn't think that Genny Kuznetsov was the answer there. Um, and you know, I, I still want to believe in Jesperi Kokanyemi. I, like I said before, there's guys I feel like I've been right on and guys, maybe not so much. I, I believed in Kokanyemi based on what I know about him and how the team feels about him. And he hasn't paid off yet. We'll see. I mean, this is a, this is probably a pivotal, a pivotal year for him. Right. Cause if it, if he can't do it again, now you have to be resigned to the fact that, all right, this guy's a bottom six player. Yeah, like you said, there's a lot of guys who need to prove themselves and makes it very interesting, too, when you get Draco Roslovic comes in, who the Hurricanes said they're looking for a right shot center. There's your right shot center in Jack Roslovic. I could honestly, I could see him playing a lot of wing this year, but if some yeah. go sideways with KK, maybe Jack Roslovic maybe goes there or maybe Jack Drury kind of moves up because he did pretty well at the two C spot in the playoffs. I know he played a lot of four C for most part of the season last year. So yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how that works out with just those guys. And just, like you said, a lot of pivotal years, especially with Martin Nietzsche, you're going from three to six and a half time to go prove that six and a half million dollars. And if, if it does, then great. Then you're looking at a guy who's, Gonna hopefully get that extension. I know last year, you know, compared to the season before, go from power play one to power play two. Do you think that kind of played into the role of 
Because his minutes did, if you look at his minutes, it did get reduced from like 18 something to like, he almost lost an entire minute of average ice time. I know it doesn't sound a lot, but if you extrapolate that over a season, that kind of does add up. Do you think that kind of led to the frustration of like he's not where he wants to be just because of his changed role last year compared to the season before? Yeah, I totally think you're dead on with that. I think, you know, there's the center thing, which I don't think, you know, which I think he really wants, but I don't think it's going to happen. And yeah. there's the there's the the ice time slash roll thing of, um, you know, getting moved to the second unit. And, and granted, he moved to the second unit and he became kind of the top option there. Like if you're on that on that first unit, you're not the top option. You know, you're not you're not yeah. the number one shooting option, you know, uh, when Sebastian Ajo's around, you're not going to be the number one guy on the, on the top unit. Um, but I think, you know, Tavo, like I said, Tavo Teravainen leaves, mm -hmm. Stefan Nathan leaves, Jake Gensel leaves, and all of a sudden, you know, there are jobs to be won uh, on special teams. And for as much, I, you know, maybe I, I'm an opt, I'm a forever optimist. Um, I get grilled a lot about the power play over the last, you know, 10 years. Um, when yeah. my, my, my line of thinking has always been, as long as you're middle of the pack, you're decent, you know, and yeah. what really matters is what do you do in the playoffs? Now, if you're terrible, if you're like the flyers were last year, then you have a real, you have a real problem, but Dude. as long as you're not dreadful, I think you have a chance to get hot when it matters. Right. right. And last year they were excellent on the power play, um, <laughs> you know, and yeah. they didn't, and they didn't need Jake Gensel to be excellent. They were excellent before Jake Gensel got there. Um, so, you know, part of the Gensel deal surprised me a little because I was like, I can't believe they would take, you know, subtract Michael Bunting just because is he doing something on the power play that's making this whole thing click a little better? Um, but obviously it ended up working out fine with the, with the power play because I think it was still good. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean, people get really bent out of shape about the, about the power play all the time. Um, and I'm always a believer of like, yeah, there's three or four teams that are going to be good every single, like Edmonton's going to be good every single year because they've got arguably the two most talented offensive players in the world on their team. You know, yeah. Pittsburgh's going to, you know, probably be good most of the time. They were terrible last year, but you know, yeah. <laughs> year after year they were good, you know, uh, any team that has Artemi, Artemi Panarin is going to be good on the power play because the guy's a wizard. You know, yeah. all those things, like, you, you know, it's it's hard to have those, you know, conversations with people where they want the Hurricanes to be a better power play and you just realize, like, there's really only usually two or three teams. You know, Tampa, you know, and even Tampa now, you know, is, is Jake Gensel what Steven Stamkos was as far as a power play catalyst? He's not the same guy. You know, Steven Stamkos yeah. scored a lot of goals ripping the puck um on the power play and that's not jake gensel's game so it'll be interesting to see how he fits there but you know there's only one or two teams usually that for those little three four year stretches are dominant on the power play and everybody else just kind of moves up and down and you know you've got the ones that are terrible and then you know the hurricanes have kind of floated through that middle part most of the time and we'll yeah. see what they do this year but um you know there's there's a, a lot of opportunity there for guys to step in could bradley nadeau step in on the top unit you know i mean he's got an nhl plus shot already so i mean he's a guy who, yeah. can, who can shoot the puck better than most nhlers already whereas the rest of his game is going to be the big question but you know could he step in there can martin natchez you know step into that you know i love the idea of having both he and svechnikov on their off wings on the same unit and if you're a defending team who do you defend you know and i mean they're yeah. it's not like they're both shooters they're both excellent passers too. Um, yeah. So there's a lot to do there. So some interesting things to think about. And another thing that I, I really want to watch in camp is see, you know, Rod Brendamore for all the, all the bluster of Rod Brendamore saying every time when, you know, we see new lines or whatever, but especially when training camp starts, you know, they yeah. go out the first time they go out with lines, 95% of the time that the opening night lineup, unless there's been an injury is exactly what he planned from the start of training camp, you know, yeah. we saw it last year, you know, we saw Tony D'Angelo with Dmitry Orloff. That's what it was at the start of camp. And that's what it was, on, you know, in game one. And yeah. so yeah. you know, for all of the bluster about, you know, Oh, you know, don't, don't read anything into the lines. We're just looking at stuff like, no, you're, 
here's what you're you're tipping your cap here and what we see on day one of camp could very well be what everything is you know by you know opening night um but yeah. there are guys like like i said i keep saying bradley nadeau's name i know mm -hmm. people like jackson blake too i think he's another guy that could use a a good chunk of time in the ahl maybe maybe bradley can too but we'll see um but and felix unger storm i think could use a year in the ahl too but if somebody yeah. comes, blows the doors off in camp like seth jarvis did a few years ago you know that could shake things up and we'll see what happens but um a lot of times what we what we'll see at the start of camp will probably be very very close to everything that we'll see on opening night i, I couldn't really said it better myself because yeah pretty much here you go. It is what it is. Now, speaking of Seth Jarvis, I know a lot of people are still like, all right, announce Seth Jarvis. What about Seth Jarvis? Like every post the Hurricanes do on social media, I know you've probably seen it. Seth, Seth, Seth. And it's like, guys, it's relaxed. It's going to get done. We know it's going to get done. But the Hurricanes are sitting at $6.44 million. And I know before the Nietzsche's deal, they're, they're floating around eight years. Could it be $8 million? Could it be a bridge deal? Like, what are your thoughts on the? I mean, we all we both know that it's going to get done. It's just what path seems more likely for the Hurricanes at this point. And I know we're not going to figure out the exact number because we're not Eric Tolsky and you know Darren York and all those guys. But what are your thoughts overall, just on the what could possibly happen with the Seth Jarvis deal? Yeah, you know, I think the thing that we really got to think about here is is he going to bet on himself or is he going to take the money? And I think maybe he's going to bet on himself um there's more cap space than 6.6 .6, um just because if you look at and i know you know we're all in a post cap friendly uh morning stage still um but puckpedia is still excellent but at the same yeah. time um when you look at you know the way the, the the site is set up now like if you just count out the players there are extra players that are going to get moved out uh once seth is signed and all that right yeah so and i mean the hurricanes aren't going to need to carry you know, a full roster and all that stuff. We'll see what they end up doing, but, you know, probably carry an extra forward and an extra defenseman, or maybe just, you know, an extra defenseman and that's it. Um, and, you know, you could always play seven defensemen if you had to, if, you know, that opening road trip, you know, we'll see what, what they decide to do. Yeah. Um, but in my gut, you know, I think the hurricanes would do a long-term deal if they could keep Seth Jarvis below Andre Svechnikov's number, which is 7.75. Mm -hmm. And I think Seth Jarvis is probably smart to say, yeah, you know, I think I'd rather wait and see what happens in, uh, in two years yeah. so um, or three years, you know, whatever, whatever kind of, uh, you know, bridge deal they come to, if that's the, the route they go. Um, but, you know, the Hurricanes also are in a cap situation where they could conceivably, you know, give him the money now. They have the space, you know, I think, you know, if it's a, if it's a $8 million deal, you know, that will work out you know, with how everything is, is structured now, you can easily move yeah. enough guys around to make that work. And, um, yeah. you know, the one, the one thing that's hanging in out there and we haven't talked about him is, you know, what's Jesper Foss's situation. And, um, everybody on social media was quick to point out he didn't have his neck brace on at Sebastian Ajo's wedding. So that's a, uh, it's a positive, but that doesn't mean anything like, uh, especially considering this was a re injury, you know, if, if you're having, neck problems and we've heard of it we heard it with eric cole in his career where they basically just told him like hey you know if something bad happens again you might not be so lucky and um yeah. you know we'll see obviously uh jesper faust is a is a great guy and uh his teammates love him and you hope he can play again but um you know not at the risk of something bad happening you know uh, the idea that andre kasha could come back and play again just terrifies me like it was like when my when michael Furlan's started talking about maybe making a comeback i'm like man you got a family like dude i get it i get you love hockey but come on now let's uh you know if uh yeah. if both my arms were falling off i'd probably stop probably stop writing unless i was just talk to texting everything <laughs> um, right yeah even like looking at shane willis with all of his concussions i mean not yeah, for scott right. stevens look at what kind of that career would have been like for him right, exactly. how he was yeah yeah and you know um so you know, we'll see how that all shakes out. The money is there, I think, if they want it to be, to give him a a, a blockbuster eight year deal and and mm -hmm. you know give him what he's going to get eventually anyway. Yeah. Um, the question just comes up to is what does Seth Jarvis want to do? Like, if you're right. Seth Jarvis and you're looking at the salary cap going up probably ten million in the next couple of years, you're probably saying to yourself, 
well, if the salary cap goes up 10, 10 million dollars, that's a you know 12 percent raise in the salary cap or whatever it would be. And yeah. you know, a lot of these deals get negotiated based on hey, I think I'm as good as this player who signed two years ago who got X percentage of salary cap. And um, so I think, you know, he could make even more money in a couple of years. So we'll see. I mean, I, I think the Hurricanes would be wise to, even if it was beyond that Svechnikov number, to get him tied up sooner. But at the same time, if you give him two years and then you give him eight after that, now all of a sudden you've got him pretty much throughout, you know, his entire career, you know, uh, until he hits, you know, his, uh, I guess, God, how old would he be? I guess he would be 32 uh, or 33, 20, you know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. About 32, 33. Yeah. Cause he's 22 right now. So yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, I'll be near retirement age, so that would be fine. <laughs> um, or maybe not, not as a journalist at retirement age, but, um, well, it's retiring. <laughs> getting, getting closer anyway. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. You know, one guy we didn't hit on at all was William Carey, and I'm, I'm curious to see him, too, and see what uh, oh, yeah. one, of the more, one of the more interesting deals we saw this offseason. And, uh, yeah, um, six, so yeah, two million for six years. I'm like, oh, hey, the AAV is great. Then it's like, you look at the years, you're like, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, all right. And, and, I, and I've said it too. If let's say two years down the road, now it's at two, two million dollars for four seasons. There's some team that would love to take that deal. So who really? I guess it's a good way of like maybe moving on at some point, or he plays the whole thing out. So, right, smart. I guess. I mean, hey, yeah, that, that's even, that's there's, that's there's, there's even the option. Guys. <laughs> yeah, there's even uh, the option of burying them in the AHL down the road, where it won't. You know, as the salary cap goes up, that number that you can bury is going to go higher, also. And yeah. so, if you have to do something in year four, where you know all of a sudden he's 33 or whatever, and he's not up to the level that. Uh, you want them to be, it's not going to break the bank to, you know, just tuck them away in the, in the minors if nobody else wants them or something. And even at that number, you know, somebody might still want them. And uh, right. I guess we're getting way ahead of ourselves on that, but, uh, just interesting. Like, hey, hey, but you never know. You never know. Interesting. Um, uh, interesting addition though. I, I, I'm curious to see how he fits in and, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, definitely a Rod Brindamore type type player. No, definitely for sure. Uh, so just two more quick things before we let you guys know we've run a little bit longer than usual, but there's a lot of great stuff we got to talk about. Um, and one last quick thing for Seth Jarvis. I know that it's not going to go to this date, but there is that December 1st deadline with RFAs, with qualifying offers and all this other stuff that you're, you're into the weeds of the CBA and all that stuff. But it's not going to be like where it was Mitch Marner and William Nylander for the Maple Leafs. We're not going to go until December. And it's like, okay, here's your deal. It's Canes fans, don't worry. We're not going to go into December without Seth Jarvis because I don't think he wants to go into December without playing some hockey. No, and I mean, people worry, you know, they think RFAs are going to get signed right away. Like, why aren't we getting it done? It should be done already. And, um, you know, no. There's, no, there's no pressure right now at all. The, yeah. the only pressure is – Hey, is he going to be in for training camp? And I don't, I don't think there's any concern at all that something won't get done before then. Um, yeah. And you know, so these things happen in August all the time. Like it's pretty regular that bigger named RFAs don't sign their deals till August. So I, everybody can take a deep breath. It's going to be all right. We're not, you know, we <laughs> don't have to start right. worrying about a lockout yet or about a uh, holdout yet or anything. Um, you know, and I don't think that's in his DNA either to, you know, hold out or something like that. I think, you know, he's, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Even to even have it cross your mind, just your, your doomsday, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Outside of naps, this kid loves hockey. Let's just be honest. Um, <laughs> so earlier this week, the Hurricanes did announce that Eric Stahl, you know, did sign that one day contract, but also did surprise him with his jersey retirement, which we haven't had once since 2011 with Rod Brennamore. And just like, what are your thoughts on the Hurricanes retiring his number? And just is there a certain like time or a story that you have of Eric Stahl, just who he was as a player, just as a person? And like I said, what are your thoughts on that whole thing of him getting his number retired this season? Yeah, I his legacy is interesting because unfortunately much of his career is tied to the struggles here. And a lot of that was out of his control. Yeah. Um, the same thing with Cam Ward, you know, I mean, uh, 
Yes, Cam Ward struggled, and uh, you know maybe he wasn't a top-notch number one goalie, even if he had been on a great team. Um, but at the same time, the times the Hurricanes went to the playoffs, Cam Ward was excellent. I mean, everybody forgets in 2009 that he was excellent until oh, the Penguin I'm series when he had hurt his back. So not only did yeah. he, have to, he have to play the Penguins, but he had hurt his back and was not at 100%. And, um, we don't want to talk so, about the backups. We don't want to talk about the backups he had to deal with too. So Yeah, sure, sure. And um, so, I mean – that's a tough part of Eric Stahl's legacy at the same time that Stanley cup championship does not happen without him. Um, just an electric season, just that, that obviously when you have a second overall player, you expect them to be good. Um, and then, you know, he comes in that first year and he, he kind of had the Joe Thornton year, you know, Joe Thornton came in as an 18 year old and didn't do a whole lot. And everybody was like, hmm, what's up with Joe Thornton? You know, Eric Stahl had made the team because of that amazing preseason he had. I think he scored seven goals in the preseason or something and yeah. made the team as an 18-year-old. And then the lockout happens. So then he goes and plays a year in, uh, in whoa, Albany, I guess, right? Um, yeah. I, I, what's it all? Now I have to remember, was it Albany? Because I heard so I heard someone else say it too. Oh no, it was the Lowell Lock Monster. Oh no, it was Lowell. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Lowell. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It was someone. In the, it's some weird name that you don't really hear much anymore. <laughs> right. Right. Um, Welcome to the yeah, AHL. My bad. My bad on that. So he goes and spends a year in Lowell and um, comes back as a, you know, a guy who had played the whole year, um, gotten better, gotten bigger, gotten stronger, and then has that incredible year as the NHL kind of changed the way the game was played. You know, um, I always think of him coming up the, uh, you know, coming up the wing and shooting far side blocker and scoring goals. You know, obviously his goal yeah. on uh, his goal on Martin Brodeur in the, in the playoffs was, was just like that, but he did that a lot, you know, um, scoring goals like that. And then, you know, the second, you know, so that, that season, um, and what he did in the seasons around those years without a whole lot of support was, um, you know, he probably doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, and even more so for the people that aren't in the locker room after games, both Stahl brothers um, would be the guys sitting there after losses, ready to answer questions every game. Every playoff game this year, Jordan Stahl was there ready to ready to answer for the team. And that's not easy. It's not easy to have people come up to you and ask you what went wrong day after day. And when Eric Stahl was there and then the first part of Jordan Stahl's career here after Eric left it was the same way. There were a lot of nights of the locker, you know, the locker room doors being open and, you know, there's that seat. It's the same seat that Eric sat in right in the center of the, of the U of the locker room yep. uh, sitting there just waiting to, for this. Uh, and granted the Raleigh media isn't a huge throng, but um, have to answer questions about why did you lose again? What's wrong? How can you be better? And both Eric and Jordan have always handled that with such class. And that really sticks out to me was it would, you know, a lot of times I remember walking up to both of them and as we would approach, they'd have that thousand yard stare of like, I can't, you know, burning to win and then just not having the, the, the horses to do it. Right. Um, and the way they both handle themselves, um, and they're both, you know, neither of them were ever the greatest quotes in the world um, with the microphone on, but they're both such good guys. Yeah. You know, just chatting with Jordan is, um, you know, and somebody, you know, somebody mentioned in, um, I think, in, you know, tagged me in a question to you about who are the best guys to talk to or something. Oh, yes, Dave. I was going to ask, yeah, yeah, Dan Wagner asked, like, who's your yeah, the, the best guys to interview? And, yeah. you know, it's not really about the interviews. Like, yes, the cameras turn on and Seth Jarvis is really funny and people want to hear what he has to say. But at the same time, if you just, like, walk up to Seth Jarvis and talk to him, he's funny. And, yeah. you know, Jordan and Eric, both, if you just be like, you know, after Jordan's tragic stuff and Eric's tragic stuff that happened with, with their family, mm -hmm. um, those personal moments with guys, I think, is when you learn, you know, Brady Shea was just a fan. Brady, Brady Shea, poor Brady Shea, in the, in the, in a uh, Invisalign, he's at the end of the, 
uh, where the media usually stands. We come into the locker room and we're in uh, the far area that's closest to where the lounge and the and the workout room is and things like that. And Brady Shea was right there and he was right, right always there. And we just always chat, just like we're not talking hockey. We're just, you know, talking about football. You know, he's a big Vikings fan. And yeah. so to me, you know, that's the thing a lot of people don't get to see about Eric and about Jordan was, yes, there were a lot of hard times where they had to answer a lot of hard questions and Eric in particular, um, cause there were so many expectations about what he could do as a player because of what had happened in, uh, 2006. And because of that draft class, like look at that draft class and then think about yeah. how many of those players would you rather have than Eric Stahl? And you're not going to, you're not going to fill your hand up. No. Um, and that's the best draft class ever, maybe. And you're not, you're not going to fill your hand up, you know, Patrice Bergeron got drafted in the second round, but, um, <laughs> You know, you look at that at that yeah. draft class, and um, Eric Stahl is right right up there with those guys. And you know, there's going to be a debate about does he belong in the Hall of Fame and things like that. And that's a, um, you know, I, I don't think he has the case that maybe Rod Brindamore does. Um, but still, like, what a career to ha- have uh, with those expectations and with everything that happened. And then at the end of his career to be willing to be that kind of role player guy just kind of speaks to who he was as a player and as a person. Um, And that's what jumps out to me is just um, a really good guy who burned to win, did win. And then he, you know, I'm happy for him that he got some opportunity, even though it didn't end up with, with a second ring, some opportunities to make some runs with some teams and, uh, play a role in Minnesota for quite a few years and be good there. Yeah, and, you know. Uh, you know, got a chance to play with his other brother in, in New York and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Just um, yeah. what a career he's had. And, you know, it was great to see him, you know, uh, sign with the Hurricanes because that's what he is, right? And then yeah. to think that his number 12 will go up to the rafters is uh, uh, pretty cool. Like, pretty yeah. cool. It could be a pretty cool night when that happens, whenever that oh, happens. Right. Yeah. Somebody was like, oh, I bet somebody tweeted at me, I, you know, I, oh, it'll be this game when Minnesota's in town. And I was like, well, unless Mark Stahl gets signed some, somewhere in, uh, in oh, I, training camp. And if Mark Stahl's playing for whoever on, oh, you, know, that could be a thing, yeah. you know, that would make a whole lot of sense, too, to have the brothers all there. And obviously, uh, yeah, you know, Jared could could be around, too. He's doing coaching now. But, you know, you find a way to make that work. And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool. Just amazing career. And um, yeah, and I did appreciate that question about, I think the thing that people need to realize is that so much about being with these guys every day and talking to them isn't about going up to them and holding a microphone in their face and asking them hockey questions. It's yeah. about talking to them and building a relationship with them and not out of like some kind of like greedy, like if I, if I can be friendly with them, they're going to tell me more. It's just, you find out, more cool things as you just talk to these guys and you get a feel for who they are as people. And so who the best interview is, isn't maybe always who the person you like to talk to the most is. And Eric Stahl jumps out to me as, you know, you know, always said the right thing. He's like a perfect, like cookie cutter Canadian guy. Like, you know, Sidney Crosby's the same way and Connor McDavid's the same way. And, uh, but then you talk to him and just realize like good family guy and, you know, talk to them about their kids and just uh, the way they glow talking about them and stuff like that. And that's, that's the cool part about talking to hockey players. It's not asking them about, you know, Oh, you know, what is it like playing in this new system and blah, blah, blah. It's about getting to know the guys and seeing how they tick and then finding out more about them personally. And uh, it's sad when they go, you know, there's the guys who left this year. It's sad to see them go, you know, the the ones that you get to know. Well, Um, I couldn't have been happier for, Stevie Lawrence to win the to win a Stanley Cup because oh yeah for I sure. talked to him at his first development camp after his draft when he had been a seventh round pick in his second time through the draft and from that moment on I was sold on the kid just because of his energy and I couldn't and he was like that his whole time here and then when I saw him when he was playing um, last season in San Jose you know he was pretty blunt about it's been a tough year you know uh but greeted everybody with a hug you know gave me a hug i'm just like um and th- those are the cool moments is you know obviously everybody knows stevie's a great guy and you know yeah. brady is a great guy but then you know you when you get to know them 
um, yeah. a little bit. Those are the cool moments that um, give you better insight into them and make you be able to write better things, not, not better things about them, but to be right, able to write better about them yeah. because you get to know them better and know how they're thinking and, you know, getting to know Tony D'Angelo a little bit, you know, it's not like the guy was like shooting daggers out of his eyes all the time. You know, uh, he liked to talk about whatever was going on in the sports world. He would, he would talk about anything. The guy knows more about sports than anybody I think I've ever met because he just knows everything that's going on everywhere. And it's just fun to get to know the guys and, and learn about them. And, uh, so yeah, to answer that little side question that I happened to see, that was, um, that's that, that's what jumped out to me. Big shout out to uh, Daniel Wagner for saying that question. Um, actually, I think that's a perfect place for us to end it. It was amazing. Corey, before we let you go, where can people, I mean, obviously people already know where to find you, but for those who don't, where can they find you on socials or where can they find you on all your writing platforms? That you yeah, NSJ, NSJ online, uh, at Corey Love on Twitter. I'm obviously writing for The Athletic, um, so you can find me in all those places. Awesome. Uh, if you want to follow me, one true Zach on X, the podcast is LO underscore hurricanes. If you click my link tree in my bio, you can find where to find all of my articles at the hockey writers over on those side of things. You can check out my other podcasts. There's where to watch and listen to the search cast along with this podcast. There's a link to listen to this on all podcast platforms. Leave a five-star rating and review. I might just read it on the show for you. Also, if you're on YouTube side of things, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification. So you don't miss a show, hit the thumbs up button. Let me know that you liked the show itself and in the comments let me know what you think is just this overall conversation i've had with Corey. yes it's over an hour but an hour of great stuff so let me know what your favorite part of the show was or if you have any questions that i can maybe shoot them on later down the road to him maybe for something that he's doing um but yeah make sure to share the show as well because we are almost at 930 subscribers we are on the road to 1000 because if we get to 1000 i might just do something special for you guys hope everyone enjoyed this friday edition of locked on hurricanes hope everyone's a great friday and has a great weekend. And as always, until next time, let's go Canes.